Hello, and thank you for tuning into the program today. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Our guest is Dr. Caroline Mitchell. She's director of the Volvo Vaginal Disorders Program at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and she's joining us today to discuss bacterial vaginosis. Welcome to Health Professional Radio, Dr. Mitchell. Thanks so much, Neil. Everything been going okay for you? Yes, it's a beautiful summer day here in Boston. Absolutely. Same here, uh, 95 degrees, I think, uh, indexes of 103. So um, I guess winter will be, winter will be here in about 17 weeks, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can uh, complain about that. Now, um, I was talking about uh, you being director of the Volvo Vaginal Disorders Program there at Mass General. Um, Volvo Vaginal Disorders, talk about um, your role there and what Volvo Vaginal Disorders are, aside from the obvious. Sure. So I am a, what's called a general OBGYN, which means I see the full spectrum of women through their early reproductive, mid-reproductive, and late um, and post-reproductive life. Um, the Volvo Vaginal Disorders Program, we see women who are um, experience either vaginal infections, vulvar dermatologic complaints, pain syndromes, um, or symptoms that have been bothering people sometimes for years that they not have been able to obtain a diagnosis for. Okay, so years without a diagnosis, we're talking um, pain in the vaginal area without a diagnosis, um, itching in the vaginal area. Uh, what type, how could it be severe enough to, to where you can't pinpoint a diagnosis uh, through someone with your expertise? Sure. Um, part of the, I would say the short answer to that is that our science is still has some holes in it. We don't understand the human vagina all that well. We don't necessarily understand why some people have no problems for their whole life and other people have lots of problems or suddenly develop problems. The causes of a lot of the symptoms and syndromes that people get are not well known. Um, I'll also say this is an area where some healthcare providers haven't gotten a lot of training um, or a lot of updates, and so the diagnosis might be there, but um, it's just not identified until folks come to our clinic. So um, bacterial vaginosis, um, is this something that is uh, exclusively um, researched at the Volvo Vaginal Disorders Program at Mass General, or are you studying everything as far as uh, those disorders are concerned? Right. So we see a wide range of um, symptoms, and we're interested in everything that impacts our patients. But my laboratory research is really focused on the vaginal bacterial community, which is really the heartland for bacterial vaginosis. Is this a common form of disorder, or is it something that um, yeah I've never heard of it myself? Uh, but then again, I don't uh, I don't visit OBGYNs ever. So um, it's not surprising. <laughs> so, you know, right. how, how prevalent is this disorder? So it depends on the population that you're talking about, but the general U.S. population is about 25% of women. Mm. Um, but it can, in individual populations, it can get as high as 50%. Mm. What women are affected? I mean, is it sexually transmitted? Is it, um, is it the environment? Uh, what, what causes this uh, bacterial vaginosis? Right. So this is an area where our science is still, has still not provided us all the answers. Mm -hmm. I think we can say that bacterial vaginosis is sexually facilitated in that if you're not sexually active at all, there's no contact of any sort. Um, you are very unlikely to get bacterial vaginosis. But once you start any type of sexual contact, oral, digital, anything at all, your, inc your risk increases. So there's something about sex, but we have not been able to find a transmissible agent, you know, if A, then B. Um, okay. And there are plenty of people who don't have sex and still get BV. Okay. Is this like a, a yeast infection where you can get a yeast infection and, and not have sex at all? Or is it similar or are they totally different? They're very different organisms, and yeast, again, there's a single thing that you can identify. Bacterial vaginosis, we think of as a syndrome. It's a change in the bacterial community, but that change can be different person to person. It's not always the same bacteria all the time that are there. That said, you can be, you know, have had sex a couple times in your life, not sexually active for a long time, and you could still get bacterial vaginosis. 
What are the most common treatments? And is this something that is easily treated once it's identified uh, correctly? So the treatment is antibiotics, either oral formulations or vaginal gels and creams. And if you ask people about a month after they're treated, our success rate is about 70 to 80 percent. But if you follow people for longer than half of people will have a recurrence within the year after their diagnosis. Does this uh, disorder increase the risk of contracting other sexually transmitted diseases? Is that some is that a, an area that should be we should be concerned with? Absolutely. Bacterial vaginosis increases your risk of HIV acquisition by uh-huh. twofold and possibly some of the other bacterial sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, when it comes to, to childbearing, uh, is this something that can be uh, transmitted to the infant through the mother if she's got it? Um, not as far as we know. Um, the risks in pregnancy are more to the pregnancy, so the risk of preterm birth increases um, and preterm rupture of membranes. Um, babies born to moms who have had BV during their pregnancy may have a bit increased risk for having to go to the neonatal intensive care unit or other having other um, adverse outcomes, but they don't have themselves the syndrome of bacterial vaginosis. You know, you mentioned, uh, we, we were talking earlier about how sometimes it can be uh, problematic to properly uh, diagnose. What are the symptoms that are associated with this disorder, and how do they differ from something that a woman might normally be used to, say a yeast infection or something like that? Right. So about half of people um, are have no symptoms at all, but the folks who do have symptoms often have discharge, odor, and a lot of vulvar and vaginal irritation. Unfortunately, those symptoms could be any number of things. It could be a yeast infection. It could be a sexual, another sexually transmitted infection. It could be um, just a, a skin irritation. And so examination by a physician or healthcare provider is important to make a correct diagnosis. Is the uh, diagnosing process, uh, I guess, cost effective as far as um, people having to pay for tests? Well, the, the gold standard for diagnosis um, is pretty old school. It's looking under a microscope and checking the vaginal pH. So that's pretty, that's pennies of cost. So basically there's, there's nothing as far as advanced research that's going to drive the cost of diagnosis uh, against the, the patient or the caregiver is for that matter. Unfortunately, microscopes um, are becoming vanishingly uncommon. Mm-hmm in many clinics, uh, and the time it takes to walk down the hall to the microscope um, is often impractical um, in busy clinics. And so there are now DNA-based or other types of um, send-out laboratory tests for bacterial vaginosis that are more expensive, but um, from a time standpoint, um, easier for the clinician and patient, and then also can get you diagnoses of yeast and trichomonas. You get the upside of additional diagnostic um, power uh, with those. Now, what would you like to say to physicians who may not have adequate uh, training or education in bacterial vaginosis, um, maybe, as you say, lacking in, in some of their skills as far as treating it is concerned? What is the one, maybe a misconception that could possibly be um, contributing to a lack of awareness? Many people feel like they can diagnose BV or yeast based on symptoms, Mm -hmm. and you can't actually. Symptoms are a very poor predictor of the clinical diagnosis, and so I would say we need to be doing exams for our patients and really trying to get to the bottom of what symptoms people present with. Well, um, is there a a place that we can go online, our listeners, and get some more information about uh, about this disorder and some of the other disorders that are treated and researched at the Volvo Vaginal Disorders Program at Mass General? Certainly. We, through the Mass General website, you can look up our program. I'll also say that the um, U.S. CDC has a really excellent website um, that covers all types of vulvovaginal vaginal conditions, uh, infectious conditions as well. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing with us today. Thank you for having me. 
You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard, with Dr. Caroline Mitchell, director of the Volvo Vaginal Disorders Program at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at healthprofessionalradio.com.au and also at hpr.fm. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, listen in on SoundCloud, and be sure and visit our affiliates page when you visit our platform at hpr.fm.